Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's uh, physics and astronomy lecture about um, habitable worlds and Goldilocks planets around other stars and what our sun's interactions with the Earth can tell, can tell us about what to expect from, from stars with planets elsewhere. Um, I have the great pleasure today of introducing Dr. David Alexander from Rice University. Um, he's the director of Rice Space Institute. He's also been a physics and astronomy professor at, at Rice for the last 17 years. And for those of you that are in my classes, you also know that um, he served as my, as my graduate research advisor and is probably the, res the one responsible for me actually having the degrees and everything necessary to actually do my job here. So, it is with great pleasure that I get to introduce uh, Dr. David Alexander and hope you guys will enjoy the talk and we'll have questions and answers afterwards. So I like the way he just blamed me. So if, uh, I'm sure he's a great professor. He was a great student. So, uh, but um, well, thanks for coming out tonight, and, uh, and uh, whoever's listening, it's, it's great to be out. I haven't seen, actually, I haven't seen Aaron since he left NASA, so it was a great opportunity to come up and see how he's doing, and um, he seems to be doing pretty well here, and I think he's got some good programs going. Um, I realized that I, uh, I didn't put Goldilocks in the title here. Um, this is sort of a more physics title, but it's the same talk. It's the same notion of looking at what we're trying to understand about these new systems that we're finding around other stars. And so I'm going to kind of walk you through a little bit of that, a little bit of astronomy to start with, and then we're going to some, do some real stuff and talk about solar physics. Um, and so bring those two, two things together around this theme of exoplanets. Obviously, you don't do science these days without lots of collaborators in various places. Um, and so my new crop of uh, students, actually, um, Aaron and uh, one of his colleagues, Anton Dow, were my very uh, first students at Rice University when I went there, so um, uh, that was a great start for me, having the kind of quality that I had there. Um, so anyway, so we have a few students in here and a couple of colleagues, and I think, does this, does the clicker work? So one of the things, one of the things that we've always been worried about, I mean, we think about the sun, this is a quote from a, a, a uh, an old colleague of mine, uh, uh, I said, actually, this quote comes from when I was only like 10 years old, so I didn't know him at that point. But it captures what we knew then and what we only recently started uh, discussing, which is the sun is the only star we know that um, supports life, us, right, and everything on the planet here. So um, what we weren't sure of was whether planets around other stars and if, uh, could those planets support life? And so that has been something that have been working on. Um, in fact, recently the Nobel Prize was just given out for the first discovery of an exo, a planet around a sun-like star. And that only occurred in 1995. So I know if you're a student here or uh, a little bit younger, um, that seems like the dim distant past. But for people like me, that's not that long ago, right? Um, and so uh, I don't, if I have a pointer, um, this is known as the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and I'm not going to give a big astronomy lecture here, but basically you can put any star that we know of on this map, and it basically goes by temperature or color. Blue stars are hot, red stars are cool. The sun is a yellow G dwarf star, so it's kind of in the middle. Here's your G star. Uh, there's the sun in there. And so for most astronomers, it's actually not that interesting. It's a really boring star. It's in a really boring part of the galaxy which might actually be quite important for why it's able to grow vegetables, right? I mean, if you were too close to the galactic center, we'd be fried by radiation from supernovae. If you're too far away from the galactic center, there's not enough material to make us up, carbon and phosphorus and all those different things. So actually, even though it might be boring as a star, it turns out it could be quite important. And then all these other things, I'll leave that for someone else who Aaron might invite uh, to talk about. This, is, this, is, this thing is called the main sequence, and one quick way of thinking about that is that's where stars turn hydrogen into helium. That's that basic process of how stars shine. These guys are big and uh, hot and burn up very quickly, maybe as small, as short as a, a few million years. The sun is currently four and a half billion years old and it's got probably another four and a half billion years 
on the main sequence before it starts moving up, up into becoming a red giant. But again, I'll, I'll leave that for someone else to talk about astronomy. Um, and of course, we have um, eight planets in our system. Um, Pluto obviously is not on here. Uh, we kind of kicked, we didn't quite kick it out of the, the solar system, but we stopped calling it a planet. Pluto is now designated a dwarf planet, and we've found a number of objects like Pluto um, since, since then. So as of about uh, an hour ago, this is the number of confirmed planets around other stars uh, in the nearby uh, region of the sun. So maybe uh, as many as 10 parsecs away or 30 light years or so a little bit, give or take. Um, and this actually changed from when I put this talk together on Friday, um, Thursday, this number was, um, I think, 4,128. So there's just been seven added basically since Friday or since Thursday night. Um, so these, this number is changing all the time. And I'm not going to walk through all of this, but the key thing is that you can see this is confirmed. So what happens is there's a mission called Kepler, a space mission. It's only looking at a small piece of the sky. Um, and so it basically doesn't see a huge number of stars. Most of them are nearby stars. We'll talk about what it does in a little bit. Um, and so it detects something it thinks is a planet. And then it has to be confirmed by follow-up observations. So when you see confirmed planets, that has uh, been uh, suggested by something like Kepler, perhaps a mission called TESS, and being confirmed by ground-based observations. So these are real planets. There are 5,047 candidates, which means there's another 912 that have not yet been confirmed, and they may not be planets. There's some interesting things that they, um, you've got to be very careful with the observations, and I'll, I'll go through that in a second. And of these planets, of these 4,135 planets, these planets are in 3,067 systems. The numbers, that num these numbers are all going to change. What that means is that there are several systems that are multi-planet, not just one planet around a star, but multiple planets around a given star, just like the solar system. And if you actually do some statistics, because this is all mostly coming from a small piece of the sky um, and a small chunk of the galaxy, uh, the suggestion is that there's roughly 200 billion planets in the Milky Way galaxy, roughly one for every star. That's a lot of planets. Some of them will be Earth-like. Some of them that are Earth-like will be in the habitable zone. And some of them may even have a, a magnetic field that could make them actually habitable. And so these are the ones that we're getting excited about. We have to start working out how to find those and then also, also how to not just find them, but be able to characterize and do better observations so that we can tell if there might be... We're not, going to, we're not going to catch a TV channel coming from another planet, but we might see evidence of uh, oxygen in the atmosphere, which is a small suggestion. We might find water vapor in the atmosphere. There may be things that we can do. And I should point out, since I'm from Houston and I work a lot with, with NASA down there, we haven't given up hope in finding life on Mars. That's not a done deal yet. Um, there's a rover going up in a couple of years that's going to dig a little bit into the soil. We can talk about Mars a little bit later. So, so right now we're looking for life on Mars. We're designing a mission to look for life on Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter. And we're trying to find planets uh, elsewhere in the galaxy that may have uh, at least the conditions for life. Whether they have life or not, we'll have to wait and see. And then you can break all these planets up. I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through a couple of how we do, how, ways of how we do it, not all of them. But you can break these up into um, Neptune-like. These are kind of called ice giants. Gas giants, where they're like Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Neptune-like means uh, Neptune and Uranus. Um, you get super-Earths, which are maybe five times the mass of the Earth. A terrestrial or Earth, Mars, uh, Venus-type planets. And then unknown speaks for itself, right? So, um, so the, you can basically break these categories down, um, in part because we can at least, in some cases, get the size of the planet. In other cases, we can get the mass of the planet. And if you can get both, you've got the density, and that kind of roughly tells you if you're gas-like or uh, rock-like or whatever. Um, and so one of the things, well, let me talk about habitability a little bit more before I, one, one of the things that we are doing at RICE is since we are, um, we've got a background in what we call solar and space physics, so we basically understand uh, study and model how the sun and the earth interact. And we sort of understand that in great detail. 
we know the Earth has a magnetic field. It's actually pretty good because if we didn't have it, we wouldn't be here. Um, and so we are trying to take that knowledge and, in, and put that into these new systems. And because I talk a lot, I'll probably skip over some of the detail there. Um, there is some math coming up for, for Dr. Coiner's students, so please pay attention when we get there. So there's five basic ways in which you detect planets. I'm only going to really talk about two of them. I'll show you a movie for a third one. Um, basically, the radial velocity and astrometry, but radio, it's the same kind of measurement, um, or different measurement, but it's the same physics. It's essentially the physics of gravity. Um, and so I'll show you that in a second. So we're going to talk about radial velocity. Transits, you can see the number of radial velocity measurement uh, planets that have been dis uh, um, detected this way is close to 800. Uh, the, transit, the transits are the different. That's, that's the planet going in front of the star and blocking some of the light. There's 3,000. So these two capture almost all of the planets I just mentioned. I updated the first slide. I forgot to update these numbers. So if, you're, if people are adding the numbers up in their heads quickly, they won't tally with what before. This would be great to be able to see um, uh, these planets directly. In other words, just look through a telescope and find them. The problem, of course, is that you only see them with reflected light. And in order to see enough reflected light, the planet has to be close to the star. And if it's close to the star, the star's pretty bright in itself. So, so it's very difficult to actually directly image planets. You, actually, you have to uh, do a fake eclipse and block out the star. And that turns out to be quite difficult. There's some really interesting stuff. This is, this is Einstein's gravitation theory, curvature of space-time working for you. Um, I'm not going to take time to go through that. And then this is essentially the same as this, and, uh, and except up here, you're looking at how the star is rotating or orbiting away and from you to, to, to make the measurements. And astrometry just means you're watching where the star is in the sky. So, so the first one gets the motion of the star towards and away from you. The last one gets the motion of the star perpendicular to your line of sight. And so um, it's a bit more sophisticated process. So this is the Nobel Prize winning discovery. Um, this is 51 Pegasi. And essentially what you do, here's the math for the students. But as you know, we don't orbit the sun. Um, we orbit the center, uh, sun and earth orbit their common center of mass. And it's a bit more complicated because we've got other planets. So when you get two bodies, they orbit each other. And it's like a tug of war. If they're both equal, the center of mass is right in the middle. The flag doesn't move. And so both this is why Pluto is not a planet, because Sharon's so big that the center of mass is outside the body of the planet. And so what happens is, well, let me show you. Um, uh, Dallas, can you hit that little box up on the top right and play that movie? Or maybe, let me see if I can do it. There we go. So this is just an animation. So what's happening is, because the planet has got a mass, the center of mass is somewhere here, the center of this inner circle. And so what happens is the planet orbits the star, uh, orbits the center of mass. The star orbits the center of mass. You don't see the planet, but what you see is the light from the star. And when the star is moving away from you, the light gets redshifted. It's called the Doppler effect. If you've ever heard an ambulance or a fire truck go by, you hear it. I'm not even going to try and imitate it, but it's, you know, you hear it, the, the pitch building up and then stretching out as it moves away from you. That's known as the Doppler effect, and it works with light as well. So when the star is, you're the, you're the observer, so when the star is moving away from you, it stretches out the light waves, that's called a redshift. When the star is moving towards you over here, it bunches up the light, and that's called a blue shift because it's making the, the wavelength shorter. Red makes it longer. So what you can do is you can look, if you know that you're looking at, say, a neon line or something like, I think of a neon lamp, if you know the color you're looking at, the wavelength moves, first it moves to the red, then it moves to the blue, then it moves to the red, then it moves to the blue. And so, let me see if I can, if this works. I may have to, okay. So what happens then is if you just watch this for quite a long time, what happens is the velocity that you can move, you can actually be by the shift there's your mathematics if you like the math the shift in the wavelength tells you the velocity of the star and this is what this does it maps out the velocity of the star and it does and what it's done is in, instead of stretching all out in time it's folded it on top of each other so it's just repeating the orbits on top of each other and so you can get the velocity 
and you can get the period, the, t the time between two troughs or two peaks. In this case, we have two troughs. So it turns out the period is four days, 4.23 days, and the velocity is about 55 meters per second. Now, 4.2 days, think about that. The way that this works is the bigger the mass of the planet, the more the effect on the star, and the easier it is to see the motion. The closer the planet is to the star, the bigger its gravitational effect, the easier it is to see the motion. You would not see this with the Earth and the Sun. So it turns out the mass of this planet, there's a little complication in here, but the mass of this planet is about the size of Jupiter. So it's a Jupiter-sized planet, but it has an orbital period of four days. The Earth has an orbital period of 365 days. So this thing is really close in. Mercury has a, an orbital period of 88 days. So this giant Jupiter, this Jupiter-sized planet, is much closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun. Not somewhere you might want to go on vacation. And then if you do the math, essentially if you know the velocity of the, this is the conservation momentum, so the mass of the star times the velocity of the star is the mass of the planet times the velocity of the planet. We get the velocity of the star from this curve. We get the period of the star from the separation of these two things. Because of Isaac Newton, we know what that means in terms of the size of the orbit. And so we know if we've got the circular orbit and we've got the time it takes to go around, we've got the velocity of the planet. Mass, we've got the mass of the star from what kind of star it is. We've got the velocity of the star from this. We've got the velocity of the planet from the period. The only thing missing is the mass of the planet. So what this does is it tells you by how this swings backwards and forwards, it tells you the mass of the planet. That's why we can get this number. So not only do you see a detection of the planet because the star is doing this, it cannot do that without a planet. Um, you can actually then get some actual properties of the planet. So that's, that was the first, we can do this from the ground, uh, ground telescopes. That was the first set of observations we got. Those are called radial velocity measurements. Um, now, a transit is essentially, we see this with Venus, we see it with, uh, with Mercury. Uh, a transit is, is, is very simple. The star's bright, so the, there's, the, there's the brightness of the star. And then comes something in the way, the planet. And so it blocks out some of the light of the star, boom. And then the planet... And so this looks really big, but this is less than a tenth of a percent. <laughs> So you have to have very, very good telescopes so you can see the, that small change in brightness. And so what happens is you get, you get a transit, you get a, 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 a diminishing of the light, and of course this happens every orbit. So if you watch a star for long enough, you'll see it dip, dip. And that dip, by pulling out those dips, you can actually get um, the fact that if it's periodic, that kind of suggests that it's a planet, and you can get the orbital period. Now the other thing is because you know how much light is being blocked, this is just a, an, an area. So you can get the size of the planet. You can't get its mass, because this isn't gravity. It's just blocking of light. But you can get its size. And the way I, uh, you know, there's not many young kids in here, but what I always do in my class at Rice is I get them to put their hands. So if you humor me, right? Put your hand in front of your, uh, right in front of your eyes. And you can, you're basically, if you point, look at me, you're basically not seeing me because your hand's in the way. And if you bring your hand closer, you block out everybody else. Your hand hasn't suddenly got bigger, it just got closer. And so what happens is, in order to see, because our observations are limited by how good a telescope we can build, the bigger the effect, the more easy it is to see. Therefore, the bigger the planet. So now imagine my hand compared to, to Wade's hand here, right? So bigger hand, you block more light. Closer in, you block more light. And so this, again, biases you towards giant planets close in. And what's surprising is we've, we think we understand how the solar system formed. Small rocky planets close to the sun, big gas giants further away from the sun. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I don't have time to go through it all, but that makes a lot of sense. All of these planets, the original, at least the first planets we found, are to turn that on its head. Because they have giant planets, which we presume means that they're gas planets, they're Jupiters, really close into the star. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So now there's all these theories about planets moving in and out of the systems that they're in over billions of years, all sorts of really interesting stuff. So these are the two, the two main methods. Um, I won't bother showing. There's, a, there's, this, there's, there's some that we see with, with direct imaging, but let me just skip that. So 
we detected planets were biased observationally towards large planets close in. Now, one of the things we think is important for life is liquid water. We, every, every piece of life on the Earth requ requires liquid water. So it's a universal solvent for, for a whole bunch of processes. Now, there's been arguments that life can exist in other forms. That may be true, but we certainly know that if, uh, if we want to look, if we want to have the best chance of finding, we know that liquid water is a good thing to look for. So how do you get liquid water on a planet? Well, you basically balance the distance of the planet from the star. The star is, is putting energy into the planet. The planet is absorbing that energy and then re-radiating it. And if it ends up being the right temperature, you can have liquid water between zero and 100 degrees centigrade. So we define that, just purely that number, and it's a nice simple calculation, but we, could, we define that number purely by how bright is the star, and how, so this is, this is the stellar temperature, which is sort of related to its brightness. Um, the sun is in here, the sun is at 5,800 degrees Kelvin. This is uh, un actually units named after the region of the city of Glasgow where my university is, and Lord Kelvin was named after that region. Lord Kelvin, William Thompson, came up with this temperature measurement. Mine is 273.15 degrees centigrade is absolute zero. Um, and so uh, 273 degrees Kelvin is the um, freezing point of water. So the sun is about 5,800 degrees, which is up here. And so here's the, the green is where, if you do the calculation, where you would expect the temperature to be just right. Inside, it's too hot. Too close to the star, you're too hot. Too far away from the, the star, you're too cold. If you're right in here, you're just right. That's why we call them the Goldilocks zone. Okay? Not too hot, not too cold, just right. And so if you look in here, there's, there's the Earth in the sun's habitable zone, this green band. Now, Venus is sort of in here, and Mars is sort of out here. So if you were looking at the solar system, if you were an alien, you know, 30 light years away looking at the solar system, you would see three potentially habitable planets, Venus, Earth, and Mars. But you know there's a three completely different planets. So this is one of the challenges we have, right? Because all we can do is detect if they're there, and we can see how far they are away. We know how bright the star is. We can, we can work out what the green zone is. And so... Um, uh, but, uh, but again, Venus has a runaway greenhouse effect. Uh, uh, Venus is 700 degrees Fahrenheit everywhere, night and day, um, and has a very, very dense carbon dioxide atmosphere. Mars has a carbon dioxide atmosphere, but it's about 1% the strength of the Earth's. And so, um, complete two planets that you would not think, uh, you, would call, you would not necessarily call them habitable, let's just say that. And so these are some of the challenges we have. Now, the biggest challenge we have is, remember, we can only detect planets, right now, we can only detect planets that are close in because of those effects I mentioned. So, as you, so if you can only measure, if you think of distance, here's, sorry, sorry, an astronomical unit is what we call the distance from the Earth to the Sun. That's our meter stick. So our, sorry, I forgot where I was. That's our yardstick, right? So our yardstick is... Um, is one astronomical unit, the distance between the Earth and the, and the Sun. And so if you go closer in, then you're too hot if you're around a star like the Sun. So if you want to have the habitable zone close in where you can detect the planets, you have to look around much cooler stars. This is a G dwarf star. These are called M dwarf stars. They're about 3,000 degrees Kelvin, about half the temperature of the Sun. And so that's Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to us, is an M dwarf star and actually has a planet around it. Um, and so what happens is you end up in this very thin region down in here. Um, and there's another complication to the story. If you did the mathematics for this for the Earth, its actual temperature would work out to be negative 17 degrees centigrade. In other words, it's a minus freezing temperature. You would not have liquid water. The reason we have liquid water is because we have a greenhouse gas atmosphere. We have water vapor in the atmosphere. We have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That adds a warming effect and it brings up the average temperature of the planet to above freezing. So now you can't just be thinking about that simple calculation, you have to think about what the kind of atmosphere is of the, of the planet itself. We've got a little bit too much carbon dioxide these days, but in the, when, the, when things were getting going, uh, there, was a, there, was the, there was enough greenhouse heating 
to bring that temperature up to, to liquid water temperatures. So this is what we, the astronomers would define as the habitable zone. Where is the temperature right for liquid water? And Aaron, you're going to have to give me a heads up if I'm... I, don't, I know you always plan to be here an hour. I'm probably going to talk for about three or four, so uh, I'll try not to. So these are what we call celebrity exoplanets. These are the ones you'll see in the news because Proxima Centauri, um, and this one is called TRAPPIST. Uh, it's a system, this is this figure here I'll mention in a second. This one is called Ross Winter, and then Tea Garden, which I can be in British, I kind of like Tea Garden. Um, these are all, you see the M numbers, these are all M dwarf stars, so they're like cooler, cooler than our own sun. This is the distance, this Proxima Centauri is the closest star to it, it's about 4. Point, uh, I'm not sure why it's 4 up there, I thought it was 4.21 light years. This is 40 light years away, this is 11, and this is 13. Uh, Tea Garden has multiple planets, uh, Trappist is like seven planets, three or four of them we think are in the habitable zone. Um, and, and so these are the celebrity planets because they seem to be Earth masses. If you look at the mass, and again, there's a little geometric complication, these two Teagarten planets are roughly Earth, uh, Earth size, 1.05 and 1.11. This is only about 30% bigger in mass than the Earth. Um, these are all roughly Earth mass, the five, six or seven of them, and this one's... So these are all roughly Earth-like planets, pretty close into a cool star. Some of them are in the habitable zones of those stars. So these are, like, fantastic. This is what we're looking for, particularly Proxima, because if you can go at 20% at of the speed of light, you can get to Proxima. If you can go at 10% of the speed of light, you can get to Proxima in, in um, 40 years. You send a spacecraft out in 40 years, and then four years later, you get the signal back telling you that they're having tea with the aliens on Proxima Centauri B. Um, except you have to be a solar physicist to know that that's not going to work, and that's, what, that's the rest of the story. Um, one of the things I want to point out about this TRAPPIST system, and in fact, if you want to look online next week, March 12, we actually have our lecture series where there's um, uh, a lady who works at NASA, uh, Sue Lederer, who um, did a lot of work on this TRAPPIST system, and that, that's kind of streamed, uh, that'll be being streamed from Houston on March 12. So these are the orbits, this is a cartoon, but these are the orbits of these planets. The gray area is the habitable zone of this cool star. And so there's three, maybe four planets inside the habitable zone. And I know you probably can't see from where you are, but if you look at this number, this is 0 0.06 yardsticks, 0 0.06 habit, uh, astronomical units. Mercury is at 0.26. So Mercury would be one, two, three. Mercury would be here. If the, sun, if the sun was at this blue star, Mercury would be over here. So all of these planets are inside Mercury's orbit. That's how close they are to their star. And that's what that's becomes a problem a little bit later. Um, the Tea Garden system is catching a lot, of ten, uh, a lot of attention. There might be two planets in its habitable zone um, based on this liquid water thing. So, and these, this, these are the kind of things that get added to every so often. Lots of planets get added every week or so, but, but uh, the kind of celebrity ones, Tea Garden was just a fairly recent one. Um, what's interesting about Ross is it's actually a quiet star, but we'll come back to that. Okay, so if you're an astronomer, we're done. Stars are hot, stars are hotter, some stars are hotter than others. Um, they have these little wobbles, uh, or the light gets blocked out, so we know there's a planet. And we can do this, some of the calculation of the orbit, and we see that these planets are close in. And if you go to the cool stars, they're close in, they're in the habitable zone, let's, do, let's, let's go you know, invite our neighbors to tea, that kind of thing. But when you actually understand what a real star is, which of course the astronomers do, I don't mean to pick on them, but um, you actually have to think about what that star, if you're that close to a star, a star is a pretty scary thing. And if you're that close to it, then you have to think about what it's doing to you as a planet. Not just how warm are you, but what other effects are going on. And this is the star-planet interactions that, that was in the title, um, my erroneous title today. And so one of the things, and, if you, and we have a, you have an expert here um, at this college, um, and all of this stuff, if you want, you, you, know, you can ask him, bug him for the next couple of months on this. Um, so this is actually, these are, these, um, most of these are real pictures. This is a, this is a cartoon, this is a, a kind of animation. But these are all, uh, these pictures of the sun are all real, real observations. And so we, we know that the star is complicated and it has lots of electromagnetic radiation. Some of it we like. Right, visible light, that gives us heat and light and warmth and all the stuff that helps us to grow vegetables. 
Um, but it also has X-ray radiation and gamma ray radiation and all sorts of other things. We know that the sun has transient effects, big solar flares and what we call coronal mass ejections. I'll show you a movie of that in a little bit. And these, they, they, they can significantly affect the radiation levels at or around the planet. Only if you have a magnetic field on your planet can you kind of protect yourself from some of this. Stars emit winds. There's big streams of particles and magnetic field coming out of stars. You're this planet. You're the little, um, you're the little dinghy out in, the, out in the, uh, the, the bay there. And these are the big waves coming in. Um, so there's a big effect there. And then you have to think about what the planet looks like itself. We, these are the things that we cannot measure. We can get some sense of the atmosphere because when you do a transit, like imagine, imagine you've got a solid body and a big puffy cloud around it. Well, when you start moving in front of the star, the puffy cloud part will block off some of the light. And you might even get some spectra because of the gases in that puffy cloud. And then as the body of the planet comes out of the end, you get... So by looking at the, nice, the, the actual shape of that dip in the light, you can maybe get some handle on the atmospheric constituents or whether it has an atmosphere at all. We see this with, with Venus going around the sun. Um, but we can't do anything about the magnetic field. We can't just measure that. We're trying to come up with ways where we might be able to. So this is what a star looks like. Um, and I think, Dallas, if you can play this, this is, this is from old data. This is a satellite that brought me to the US. Um, this is the X-ray emission from the sun. So it's, it's not an X-ray picture of the sun. It's the sun is so hot, the atmosphere is so hot, that it doesn't emit visible light. It emits X-rays. And if you play that, so it's going to be slow, and then it will just play regularly. So these are, where it's bright here, these are sunspots. But they're the, they're the hot stuff above sunspots. And as you can see, when there's lots of material, this is the aurora, the northern lights or the southern lights. And so you can see that maybe, you know, if you watch carefully enough, you'll see that when there's lots of sunspots, there's lots of radiation coming from the star, there's an effect at the planet, a geomagnetic effect at the planet. This doesn't hurt us, it's not damaging to us, it produces pretty lights. It, you might be a problem if you happen to be an astronaut doing a spacewalk or if you're a spacecraft um, that isn't prepared for this, you can get short-circuited and all sorts of stuff. Um, so that tells you that there's a direct input, something at the star, affects the planet. Now, before you play this, Dallas, um, I think you had it quite loud. I'm going to show you some of this stuff in slow motion, but in the next 30 seconds, you're going to see what an actual star, a real star, like the sun, not one of these... This is all data, it's not computer simulation. You get extra points if you tell me the music. My son's a French horn player, it's Mahler 5, so you can't live, if you're a French horn player, you can't live without Mahler 5. So what you just saw there was actual data. This is not like, oh, this would be cool if we put it in a Star Wars movie. This is what the sun does. Some of it is in X-ray, some of it is in ultraviolet radiation, some of it is visible. A um, Couple of different techniques that we have to do. Most of it comes from space. In other words, we have telescopes in space looking at this. And I'm gonna give you a couple of key couple of little examples just so that you, I'm sure you didn't take all of that in. You're too busy listening to the music and trying to work out where it was. So, um, let's see, is this the one I wanted to do first? Yes. So, this is, the, this is the edge of the sun. This is called the chromosphere. So, this is, um, it's like porridge. There's a lot of granulation going on. And so, this is the effect in the atmosphere. This is, everybody likes this because it looks like a big fiery ball, which is what everybody thinks the sun is. And this is a solar flare. And you can see this is the size of the Earth. And so this thing is maybe 50, 60,000 kilometers high. And you can see gravity is winning in this particular case. It's pulling all that material back. If you go back to the, when, it, when it repeats, you'll see there was nothing here right at the beginning. So something released a bunch of energy, and it turns out it's the magnetic field. And what you're looking at is magnetic field lines from a positive polarity to a negative polarity. And this superheated ionized gas called a plasma fills up those field lines and shines in, this is, uh, uh, I guess this is helium-1, so it's shining um, in 
uh, three, well, it changed that specific wavelength. This happens to be, I think, three, uh, 304 angstroms. But anyway, so you see this bright emission that wasn't there originally. So we call that a solar flare, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on all over. The sun is a very, very dynamic thing. And then, now, before you play this, I want to point something out here. So again, this is now looking again at helium-1. So this is a chromosphere of the sun. This is called a solar prominence. You might see that if you went to a regular uh, just with a telescope with a solar filter on it. This is called plage, which, for those of you who know a little bit of French, means sandy beach, and because it looks like a sandy beach. Um, and underneath here, there's probably a sunspot, and then these dark streaks are called filaments. Um, and you can see the mottled pattern, which is the kind of porridge making that goes on um, at this, uh, below the surface of the sun, um, essentially convection. Um, and I want to draw your attention. See this thing that looks like someone has scratched the lens, this little black line here? Well, it turns out that's a real object. It's a filament, and it's called a filament because it's filamentary, it's long and thin. This thing looks tiny. It's 50,000 kilometers long, and it's up about 5,000 kilometers from the surface. So it's quite a large thing. And if you look at that, you would say, well, look, yeah, that's, okay, that's a tiny little thing. What about this big thing up here? And if Dallas, if you play the movie, watch this little thing. Boom. So halfway minding its own business, sitting there going about its day, and then all of a sudden it explodes, it erupts, we call it eruption. And this tiny little thing, remember, this is a star. You could fit a million planet Earths inside the ball of gas I'm just showing you here. And this thing, which was this tiny little sliver, boom, you can see stuff falling back. We'd, we lose it because our field of view is only here. I'll show you what it looks like a little bit further out. And so our job as solar physicists is to try and watch that thing and go, hey, it's about to do this. And it's, very, it's hard to do that. And so the, the analogy I like to give, I, I always forget to bring the actual example, is if, you, if you're kind of sitting in Dr. Connor's class and it's like one of these other boring physics classes and you're playing with a rubber band, right? You'd be twisting and stretching the rubber band. And what you're doing is adding energy into the rubber band. If you twist it too much or you stretch it too much, it can snap. And this is exactly what's happening with the magnetic field. The magnetic field is stuck in all of this stuff that's moving in the porridge, cooking, moving, moving stuff around. And what happens is you stretch the magnetic field so much that it snaps and it releases all of this energy. It releases electromagnetic energy, um, it releases kinetic energy with the eruption, and it, it basically puts a lot of energy into particles and so it can accelerate protons, for example, up to a significant fraction of the speed of light. Lots of energy all suddenly released from that rubber band snapping. It's very, very hard to know when that rubber band is going to snap. And so we have to sort of follow this along and try and predict this as we go. Because the astronaut, this is the kind of thing that can affect astronauts. Anyway, I'm getting off the habitable planet thing. Now, what we're looking at here before we play it, um, this is a similar, it's not the same event. And because we're looking at ultraviolet radiation, which we can't see, we can make it any color. So we have a green sun. So f this is three different telescopes superimposed on top of each other with using, using a computer. Um, and I always say that these are, you're going to see a coronal mass ejection. We're not very good with names. This just means the ejection of mass from the solar corona, which is this stuff here. So here's the, here's the sun. You, can, you now know where the sunspots are. You're going to look down here and you're going to see something. This second, this black ring, what we've done is created a fake eclipse. We've put a black disk in front of the star so that we can see this stuff. And then the third telescope has got a bigger disk, so we've got a bigger disk in, uh, blocking the star so we can see this stuff. So this goes out to about, I think, close to 20 million kilometers. Um, and so again, this thing here, you can fit a million planet Earths inside it, that's a star. And you're gonna see the filament, the filament you can't quite see here because it's kind of fuzzy, but you'll see something happen here and this is 20 million kilometers later. Dallas, if you can play it, please. La, 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 la. Oh, oh no, it's, it's, it's going to have to, there you go. Boom. Oh, can we repeat that? I think it stopped. My big effect went away there. Boom. Uh, for some reason, it's cutting off at the end. The bottom line is, if you look at this, this thing, when it comes out, it's bigger than the star itself. Um, it gets all the way out, and it, you, it, for some reason the movie's cutting off, it goes all the way out. Now, the good thing about this one is you're the Earth. 
So this one's gone off to the side. It's not coming to the earth. If you add up all the mass, even though it looks huge, it's very diffuse. So if you add up all the mass, it's got about the average mass of Mount Everest, 10 to the 16 grams. And so you've got a 10 to the 16 gram ball of gas that's bigger than the sun coming at you, and it comes out at about a couple of million miles an hour. Now, what happens is when it's going to, when the next movie, before we play it, what we're doing here now, we're playing with colors here, this is now one that's going to come right at you. But because we're blocking the middle star, we're blocking the star with a disc, you don't see it coming at you until it's big enough to surround the disc. So you're going to see, so in the previous one, it kind of looked like this coming out of the side. It's now coming like this, but now you're blocking the middle section, and so you see what we call a halo, a halo CME. And watch, it, watch what happens. So, and then we stick a star in here just for fun. So if we play this movie, you can see some background stars up here. This is the solar winds pulling the material out, boom. And wait, and look at that. Every one of this, that's a proton mostly that's been accelerated to something like 20% the speed of light. That's a fast train coming at you. So if you're an astronaut or if you're a piece of hardware like a spacecraft, this star, this coronal mass ejection, has created the conditions to accelerate those background particles too close to the speed of light. And they get to this. So this, if, you, if you've done the calculation in your head, a million miles an hour, a couple of million miles an hour, it will get to 93 million miles away, right? It will get to the Earth in two or three days. So the actual coronal mass ejection takes two or three days to get here. But the light from the star is getting to the Earth in eight minutes. And if you're going at 50% the speed of light, you're going to get from the star, from the sun to the Earth in 16 minutes or so. And so what happens is these particles are coming at you 16 minutes after you've got your first warning. It's very hard to do anything about that, right? You can't put the uh, batten down the hatches. You can't get the astronauts back into the space station. All sorts of stuff that you can't do. Um, and so we can talk and talk and talk and talk, which I can, about solar physics. But what I wanted to show you is this is what a real star does. Now imagine you're a planet sitting in here, right? Imagine you're one of these Goldilocks zone planets around an M dwarf. And it turns out Proxima Centauri does 50 of these things a day. So now you've got a planet that's sort of sitting here and it's doing this 50 times a day. Okay. I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to jump through some stuff. I, I won't bother bore you with all our modeling. But this is what we have to worry about. So you may have liquid water because the temperature balance works out just right. But how are you going to survive all of this? Well, one way is if you've got a magnetic field. So um, if we could, this is now what happens at the Earth. So this is your 30-second uh, uh, movie of what happens at the Earth or when, when all this activity happens. And again, there's bonus points if you can name the music. Dallas? just in what happens at the Earth. But just think about what the Earth is. The Earth's a planet. <laughs> and it's been affected in this way by a star, which is the sun, that happens to be really quite far away, if you think about it, compared to the planets that we're, we're discovering around other stars. And those other stars, in some cases, are far more active than the sun. So you've got the star being far more active, and you've got the planet being really, really close. Think about habitability and what that means. And so that's what, that's what we've been studying. We're looking at how does the magnetic and energy activity of the star affect the planet? How can we character, astronomers like to make observations. How can we suggest observations that you should make to find out if the stars, if the planet's okay or not okay? In other words, if it truly is a Goldilocks planet, like it's now sleeping in the bed, not just had the porridge, but it's now sleeping in the bed, right? We have to work out what's happening with the, uh, I'm not going to push that analogy any further, but, um, you know, just what's going on with all of this stuff. Um, and so we, what we've been doing at Rice is modeling how stars are similar or dissimilar to the sun and modeling what happens at the planet. We've got a long history at Rice of being able to do the, 
sophisticated modeling to look at how, uh, think of the star as a hammer and the Earth as a gong. We've been studying the gong in great detail for a long time um, at Rice. And then we have to worry about the wind. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff here. Um, the key thing that what this is showing you is this is a solar cycle. So the sun, if you count sunspots, the sun has an 11 year heartbeat. Lots of spots, few spots, lots of spots, few spots. Every 11 years, there's a maximum. Currently, we're in the minimum. We're down in here right now. But th what this does is it takes a picture of this. And this is a picture of the magnetic field of the sun during solar maximum in 1991 in this case. Back to maximum in 1999. I know that's only eight years, but we're, you know, th this continued. This is the last data we had at the time. And this has now been completed. I just happen to have an old picture of it. This is solar minimum. This is when there's hardly any sunspots. This is when there's lots of sunspots. And what this is, is the heat, the radiation coming from the star at the same time. And so you can very clearly see that when there's lots of magnetic field, when there's lots of sunspots, there's lots of electromagnetic radiation. So in other words, all of that energy is coming from the magnetic field, the snapping of the rubber band. So we have to understand the magnetic field. And there's a whole bunch of ways we do that. Um, blah, blah, blah. The model works really well. This is a simulated model of the sun. This is what Proxima Centauri would be like, except it's about seven times smaller. So in other words, if this is, all, if this is the sun um, in terms of activity, white and black are the, two, are the bunch of sunspots. This is at solar maximum. You can see the intensity is far Wait, this is old GIF, so I need to get better pictures, but the intensity is much more intense at Proxima Centauri. And we can actually, because we can do some physics, we can look at the magnetic field on the surface and we can work out what it looks like in the atmosphere. And so we can actually map out this magnetic field all the way out to the planet. And this is sort of just a representation of that. This is the sun. And this is what we'd say Proxima B would look like. And you might not be able to see the difference because there's so many lines, but there's lots more detail in here, lots more magnetic energy. And so what we've done, this is, I, 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 this takes a bit of explaining, but what I wanted to show you here, these lines are orbits. So the, this is an orbit in what we call the ecliptic plane. This would be like the Earth around a star. This is a 30 degree inclined orbit. This is the sun. So at solar minimum, basically you've got a nice magnet. You've got a negative polarity and a positive polarity. It's called a dipole. Basically, positive in the, uh, the top half of the sun, negative in the bottom half of the sun. That's at minimum, hardly any sunspots. As soon as you start sticking sunspots in, this becomes a little bit more complicated. You've got all these excursions, so it's no longer just blue in the top half and red in the bottom half. You've got all of this mix in between. So this is our fiducial point. This is what we know about the sun. We've tested it against the observations of the sun, and it all works really well. If you go to a star that's about a tenth as active as the sun, so not, not so many sunspots and so on, nice dipole at, solar, at the minimum. When you get to maximum, yeah, you can see a little bit of structure, but there's hardly any difference between minimum and maximum. And so the planets are basically going to see the same sort of stuff. It turns out every time you go from red to blue, you get a big geomagnetic storm, and that could be problematic for getting life going on a planet. When you get to something that's 10 times more active than the sun, even minimum has all, even minimum starts to look like solar maximum, the minimum for this star. And then up here, your guess is as good as mine. It's so complicated. You can sort of see this is because the cycle has changed. This blue is where it's supposed to be at the bottom, but suddenly all this red comes up there. This is not how normal stars, this is, this is a signal of very, very uh, complex um, uh, magnetic field on that star. So when you get to much more active stars, the planet can see huge transitions and very many of them. And then the next time it can be completely different, but still as complicated. So what we're trying to do is start to uh, model what the environment around, the magnetic environment around the planet would be. In other words, what is it having to interact with? And this is in addition to all of the electromagnetic radiation that's coming from the star. And then, just to give you an idea, I'm going to build, I'm going to show, there's a complicated thing that, um, a thing called the Alphane surface. And the best way to think about that is, um, if the planet, so we, we, I've told you we can model the magnetic field. Well, the, the planet also has, uh, sorry, the star also has a, a wind coming from it. 
And close to the star, that wind is what we call subsonic. And at some point, at some distance, it becomes supersonic. Now, what does that mean? Um, subsonic, uh, so think of, of uh, uh, the river being uh, your standard velocity. You're, you're flowing down the river. You go out on a jet ski or a motorboat, and you can go faster than the flow of speed of the river. And what happens? You create a bow shock, right? You see the big shock. And, and so what happens is you build everything up in front. And so when you transition from being sub the sound speed to super the sound speed, you, that transition is essentially the alpha in surface. It's a little bit more complicated than that. What it means is that if you're inside that surface, you can have a magnetic connection right back to the star. In other words, instead of having your planet be an obstacle, like the Earth is for the solar radiation or the solar wind, you actually have the planet open up to the star. Well, that's not good. It's probably OK if you're just a planet, but it's not good if you're trying to live on that planet, because now what you have is a direct pipeline to a star that's four, three, four, five thousand degrees and, a, and uh, all that uh, connection back to the, to, the, to the star. And what happens is, and this is what this kind of shows, is you start losing essentially all your atmosphere. And so even if the planet's in the Goldilocks zone, even if it's got a good strong magnetic field, um, and even if it's got a nice atmosphere, because it's inside this surface, this physics surface that we can talk about later if you're really interested, um, you can be connected to the star, and your atmosphere, by some calculations, may only last 10, 100 million years. That's a lot, of course. But for us to be here, that, we, need, we still need that atmosphere, and we've been around the sun for 4.5 billion years. So, so losing your atmosphere in terms of astronomical timescales in 10 to 100 million years is not good for having life on that planet. So you do not want to be inside this surface. Okay, so whatever that surface is, this magic surface I've just mentioned, you do not want to be inside it. Well, I've told you that we've just worked out, well, showed you that previous thing, we can calculate, based on what the sun does, we can calculate or, or give a fairly good estimate for what the magnetic field of those stars look like, and so we can work out where that surface is. And when we do that, so I'm not going to go through all of this in detail, but when we do that, and we can do whether you're at minimum activity or maximum activity, it doesn't matter, so these curves, this is some error bars, but these curves are the locations of that surface. And this magic number is just, this is the sun at one. These stars are progressively more active than the sun. Right? So stellar activity increases in that way, more active towards the, the origin. And this is the calculation for that magnetic field. This is where this magic surface is. Look where all the planets are, that we, all the celebrity planets. All the ones that are in their habitable zone for liquid water. All of Trappist is inside, it's, ha it's down here, it's a very active star. It's inside its alphane surface. Proxima Centauri, way inside its alphane surface. Here's Ross, which is kind of a nice star because it's not all that active, but it's way inside its alphane surface. And there's, here's Tea Garden. So this one's kind of interesting. But all of these stars that everybody likes because they're observed, they're definitely planets, sorry, planets. They seem to be in their habitable zone. Temperature's just right. These are the Goldilocks planets, but they're fried. When you do this calculation, these things are fried because they're basically connected directly to the star. They're not just out in the distance being, a, being protected, even if they've got a magnetic field. The Earth is, the Earth, if you, so here's the sun. This is, um, this, is, this is all scaled relative to the sun. So the sun's alphane surface, so if you were to put the sun's alphane surface on here, you're up here. Uh, sorry, sorry. The sun's alphane, let's see, this, the Earth is 10 times the distance of this alphane surface. So if this was the sun's alphane surface, the Earth is a couple of stories up. So we're way outside this thing. There are lots of planets outside their star's alphane surface. The problem is um, that we, uh, they're not in the habitable zones of those stars. So you can't, you've got to have both. You've got to be protected in terms of the, sun, the stellar activity, and you've got to be uh, in the Goldilocks zone when it comes to temperature. We do not have a planet, as far as I know, that satisfies both those conditions yet. And then you can do a whole bunch of other things, and I'm running out of time. I always put this up because I don't understand it. 
But this is what happens at the planet when you try and do all the physics because of what the sun is doing. You shine ultraviolet light on it, you generate currents, and you've got currents that go from pole to equator, you've got currents that go around the equator, you've got iron ring currents that do all sorts of stuff. I think somebody's going to talk to you about magnetospheric multiscale where you'll get maybe some of this data. I'm not going to try and explain this because I don't understand it myself. But basically, there's a lot of effect on the planet. And so what we're trying to do is look at that effect, that's the other part of the modeling, and work out how much radio signature would come out. So magnetic fields and particles work together, they produce radio waves. We can go look for those radio waves if they're detectable. And so what we, what we have done is done all those calculations. It's, again, I don't really have time to go through this. The bottom line is when you do the calculations properly, that previous map I showed you, it, the, the activity was so strong, it was pushing the magnetic field of the planet all the way down to the surface. When you do that, the, the magnetic field is no longer protecting the atmosphere and you lose your atmosphere. What we've found is if you do it properly, if you, do, you add a little bit more of this coupling, we can, we can puff up the magnetic field a little bit. So that's a detail. But the point is we can do this modeling. We can look at how the ionosphere is being affected and how the planet is responding to the stellar activity. And um, I won't play this again because we're, we're running out of time. Um, so let me just skip that. But the key thing is, and this is a complicated figure, which, okay. I just want to say one thing about this. So it turns out some other, uh, some radio astronomer has done a calculation based on the solar system planets, and he has said that the amount of radio emission coming from a planet is directly proportional to the amount of energy being input from the star. Makes, makes kind of sense. He says it's a straight line. And so astronomers have said, aha, if it's a straight line, we can scale up to how active the star is, and we can work out how much radiation we come from the planet. It turns out there was a few planets that we should be able to see. And if we can see the radio emission from the planets, we can learn something about the magnetic fields. If we know their magnetic fields, we know whether they're protected or not from that particular star. It turns out if you do the physics right, all that complicated stuff I showed you, if you do the physics right, the, Earth's, the planets... Uh, atmosphere can only take in so much energy. It can only support so much of these currents. And when you do that, you get what's called saturation. And so this dashed line, it, I know it doesn't look like a straight line because it's a different kind of plot. This dashed line is that prediction. So astronomers go, oh, great. This is how active our star is, so we should be seeing lots of radio emission. Well, it turns out if you do the physics right, you get saturation. And so you basically get a cap. It's like a salary cap in basketball, right? You can't earn any more than this. And so what that means is, if you do the calculation right, the predicted radio emission is about two or three orders of magnitude, 100 to 1,000 times less than the straight line prediction, which explains why when we've gone looking for this radiation, we haven't seen it. So very, very complicated set of stuff, a bunch of physics at the end there. But the bottom line is you have to understand the planet. You have to understand the star. You have to understand the interaction. And you have, you're, you're faced with very limited sets of observations. We can study the Earth like crazy, we can study Venus like crazy, and Mercury like crazy, the Sun like crazy, but we don't have a lot of information when all we are getting is a wobble. <laughs> right? If all we're seeing is the wobble of a star, that's good, it tells us there's a planet there. So we have to sort of combine this with the modeling, and that's sort of what, that's the, that's the key takeaway, is liquid water, temperature just right, the Goldilocks part is only a small part of the story you really have to start thinking about the star plant interaction. So, to finish, temperature and pressure gets you liquid water. That's a good thing. Long-term stellar activity, uh, understanding that, can give you a stable climate, which is good for life to become complicated, like us. Radiation, now you have to worry, are you going to lose? The reason Mars has such a poor atmosphere is because it lost its magnetic field about three and a half billion years ago because it's a small planet which meant the magnetic field wasn't protecting its atmosphere from that solar wind. And so the solar wind essentially stripped away Mars's atmosphere. So in order to keep your atmosphere, you have to have a magnetic field, fighting against both the radiation, because if you heat the atmosphere up, it can uh, leave. If you, if you hit it, strip it off with stellar wind. So you have to understand this connection. Solar flares and coronal mass ejections, that means that you might have liquid water, but you do not want to come up on land. So you're going to stay in liquid water, which means they're going to be hard to detect, right? 
If you're building big, sophisticated radio beacons and watching I Love Lucy and stuff, you can det eventually detect those planets. If they're at the bottom of the ocean of that planet, you're, you're not going to see them. And so we have to understand the planetary magnetic field. Long, complicated story, but a very simple, I think, message, I hope. Um, and I think I can stop there, and I'm happy to take any questions. So thanks again for your time. Any physics questions, I will refer you to Dr. Corner or his students. I, I, I somehow expected that was coming, but, um, but once again, David, thank you very much for, for coming, and thank you guys for um, coming to support our Physics and Astronomy Lecture Series. I actually do want to, before we get into q and I do want to give uh, our collaborator within the, physics and, uh, within the physics department and the engineering department, Crystal Hopper, a little bit of a chance to talk about uh, some of the events that we have coming on in the department, and then we'll get into the, to the Q&A aspect. Okay, <laughs> she, she's deferring, so we'll do Q&A first. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand, and we will bring the microphone around. And while we're doing, I'd like to thank Dallas and his helpers up there in the, in the booth there for uh, getting us actually going. <laughs> Didn't look like it for a while. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Alexander. Um, I'm wondering about, I've heard this before, that the, how many of these planets would be tidally locked because of gravitational gradient close to the star? Would those of these planets that we found, how many, what percentage of those would be locked that way? Actually, I'm not, I don't know the answer to that in terms of a, in terms of a number, but um, in fact, I don't know if we know it for certain for a lot of them because it, it takes, um, you have to know the rotation of the star and you have to know the rotation of the planet and you can do some calculations of it with the distance in, but it is actually a very important question because again, um, if it's tight, think about the moon. Right, for those of you who are maybe not sure what tidally lock means, if you think about the moon, we only ever see one face of the moon. And that's because over a few, you know, billion, a couple of billion years or so, um, the rotation of the moon has synced with the Earth. And so the, the rotation of the moon is, is essentially tied to that of the Earth. And so every time we're trying to look around the corner, it rotates out of the way. So we only ever see about 56% of the moon. That's what's happening to a, a number of these planets. And I'm sorry, I don't know the number. Um, but it's, again, it's an uncertain number anyway. And so what, me, what that means is, even if you had all of the stuff that was good from what we said, um, now they would have to be pretty close in. So my guess was that a lot of them would be inside this alphane surface, but they might be in the habitable zone still. But what it means is that, that one side of the planet is very, very different from the other side. Because one side, it's, think, about, think of Mercury, right? One side is constantly hot, the other side is constantly cold. Um, bringing that tidal locking in is something that needs to be done. Um, for people, so there's, I've been focusing on the kind of magnetic interaction and habitability question, but um, just the fact that we have now 3,000 systems means we don't have one. We have 3,000. So people, and um, we're trying to, ha we're actually in the process of, of um, doing a faculty search at Rice right now on this very theme, and so the challenge is um, how do we understand these systems? How do we understand if a a Jupiter is migrating in, what does it do? If it gets in, is it tidally locked? What does that mean for, for subsequent planetary formation? What happens? So these are, these tide, this tidal locking is a very, very important question. We're not at the point where it sort of matters for habitability, but it does matter for understanding the formation and evolution of systems as a whole. It could turn out to be, even though there's an observational bias because of the nature of how we detect these things, it could well be that the solar system is actually quite unique, um, which would be interesting in itself. Um, so these are, these are questions that, we're, we're, now that we're getting more and more data, these are questions that people are actually trying to, to address fully. The other thing I should point out that I didn't maybe make clear too, um, and it's the reverse of tidal locking in a sense, and that is, if you think about trying to detect, even if you had a great telescope, and you could detect an Earth around a sun, think about that, in order, the Earth goes around the sun once a year, so in order to be sure that it's a planet, you have to see multiple orbits. So now you have to observe, observe the same system for multiple years, five, six years. 
So now you look at one system for six years, you look at a second. So that becomes a challenge observationally as well. And so these are things that are trying to work, be worked out as well for the observations. But tidal locking is, a, is, is something that we're, um, for exomoons as well, there's a lot of interesting things to do with tidal locking. So my, my question is um, maybe something that might help explain a little bit. Um, what kind of instrumentations that you're using, a type of equipment you're using for investigation, you know, sort of a synopsis of the type of uh, telescopes and things like that to, to, to help you explore exactly what's going on with those planets? So there's two parts to that. From the, from the discovery part, of course, we're just using big telescopes. And so we have telescopes, and the Keck telescope is one of the, one of the, the major radial velocity uh, measurements um, on the ground. NASA has flown a couple of space missions that have been very, very careful, very, very good uh, photometry. Um, TESS is up right now, and it's, got, uh, it's looking at the whole sky. Kepler only looked at a little bit of the sky. So from the point of view of detection, um, we have various tools available to us, but there is a fundamental limit as to how small a planet, how far away from the star you can get. Um, there are uh, telescopes and plan the, the, the um, I can never remember the name of them, but the, 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 great, the giant Magellan telescope and the great big telescope are being built to sort of look a little bit more closely. When it comes to the kind of stuff, what we're in the process of doing is trying to take the calculations that we are doing and, and, the, and the, the numerical modeling that we are doing and simulate what we think the observations might look like. So for instance, we can, we have the magnetic field in our model. Um, it's very, very hard to measure magnetic fields around other stars, essentially, I mean, crudely speaking, just because they're so far away. But there are some measurements coming out. There's a technique called Zeeman Doppler imaging. And so they're, they're getting kind of fuzzy pictures, if you like, of the field, but we can simulate those and then compare those with observations. There are indirect methods that you can do. You can look at how stars spin down, so you can look at lots of different stars and see if they're all kind of the same but different ages. Does the rotation pattern fit what you would expect for the models that we have? We know that the magnetic field generates the, the, uh, the uh, energetic emission, so we can take our magnetic field, we can assume that relationship and then we can say, here's how, how bright this star ought to be. Even if you can't measure the magnetic field, if you can measure how bright it is in the X-ray or the EUV band, you will be then able to say something about its magnetic field. And then what we'd really like, when we do all those calculations at the planet, what we'd, able, what we'd really like to do is be able to calculate the radial emission of that planet. And then we're actually in the process of working with Caltech in California um, to extend the Owens Valley Radio Observatory to start to look for some of these signatures. My, my feeling is that it's going to be a while before we get to the sensitivities we need, but all of that activity I showed you from the sun, those transient activities, they can increase the radio power by a couple of orders of magnitude. The problem is they only last a couple of hours, so you'd have to watch and get lucky with all the planets. So we're starting to think a little bit more, not just about doing the computer models, but what does it mean for observations? Because astronomers won't believe you if they can't observe it, which is fair enough. And so we're trying to put all those things together and then look exactly what kind of telescope or combinations that we'd like to be able to, to determine some of these things. So, um, we're still, again, 1995 isn't all that long ago. It's just a very, very young field. And for the most part, until maybe the last four or five, depends how you count it, maybe let's, let's say even as far as 10 years, it's all been about discovery. Can we find more planets? Can we find habitable zone planets? Can we find Earth-sized planets? Now we've got such a large number, we can start to think about the physics of these systems. And so that will change the kind of observations we make. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, yeah, we can't just say, oh, we just need, you know, if you want to give us $100 billion, I'm sure we could build something on the far side of the moon and we'll, we'll find everything you need. So there's a, there's, a, there's a little jar outside if you want <laughs> uh, for that. Sorry. So with solar winds affecting and stripping away the atmosphere, um, is there any way to recover or protect against um, you know, the stripping of our atmosphere, and how would you go about that in like, protecting it in any way? Well, 
I, I think it would be uh, that, that would be a big geoengineering project if we were trying to do something like that. I mean, I think the planet does it itself, basically, and that is that it either has a magnetic field um, or it produces more gas, right? So, and, and those tend to go hand in hand with larger planets. So, one of the reasons Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere is because it doesn't have much of a field. And the reason it doesn't have much of a field is because it's a small planet. It's about half the size of the Earth, which means it cools much more quickly. And if you, if you cool interior, the interior of the planet cools very quickly. And if you don't have a hot planet, if you don't have a hot interior, you can't get the iron core to move. It's a solid body. And for, to create a magnetic field, you need a charged a conductor that's moving, rotating and convecting. And if you freeze the core, it doesn't do that. And so Mars's field production switched off. Because you're not generating internal heat, you don't have that liquid conductor, the iron, but neither do you have volcanic activity. So on the one hand, you're, you're taking away the shield that's protecting your atmosphere, and at the same, because, of the same, because of the same reason, you're stopping the production of new atmosphere. So the planet ends up, you know, it's just, you have to go look at the size of the planet. If we were trying to help us, I mean, the Earth, we're, we're okay, although the Earth's field is start, we think maybe starting to flip. And it, if it flips from north-south to south-north, it takes several thousand years. It could go through zero. Then, then we're sort of in Mars's situation, at least for a certain amount of time. How you protect it, I mean, people have talked about weird stuff about putting a, a, a big magnetic field between us and the sun. And, you know, uh, actually creating a fake magnetosphere somewhere near Venus so that we can protect the Earth from all this stuff from the Sun. I don't think the Earth has to worry. Um, but these other planets, it's just really right now what we're in at is how, how big are they? The solar wind's not going to go away. Well, it did go away for, what was it, the, the day the solar wind disappeared, right? That was... Yeah. Roman, Roman might talk about that. Um, so I think we, can't, we cannot protect ourselves, but I don't think we have to for the Earth. Um, and what we have to do is just understand the processes so when we see these other planets, like we're starting to, like I said, I think we're starting to build up a picture of what happened on Mars. Venus doesn't have a magnetic field either, but that's because it's rotating too slowly. But, um, but right now, what I, we're not at the point where we have enough planets and we have enough the right observations to study that in other systems. What we're actually hoping is that we have a planet that's got a big enough magnetic field that we can see the signature of that. And that would be one planet out of 200 billion, but we'd start to uh, refine those observations. So. Um, I was wondering, uh, uh, when you were talking about magnetic force and stuff, I was thinking about uh, magnets and how they, uh, if you put one side to another, um, they will... Uh, push each other away and uh, take the other spot. What I was thinking with the Earth's magnetic field is um, if you had another planet like Earth um, and it came uh, towards us and uh, pushed our us away would would it like take our spot and would it even push us away so if that was to happen it would depend so the s field we well, just by our definition points up points northward um so if another planet came in that pointed up then yes and we actually know this i mean but that's not going to happen but, and the reason i say that it may have but it may have happened something like that may have happened in the past Although, at the time where it might have happened, the, the material that makes up the planet hadn't settled, and so we would not have, these planets would not have had magnetic fields. So I don't think it ever happened where the, the magnetic field came in. But we see that exact process every day, but it's not a planet in the Earth, it's these coronal mass ejections. Even though we're talk, we talked about the gas, they actually have a magnetic field. And when the magnetic field is northward, like the Earth, it's a bit like, if you think of the Earth's magnetic field like a balloon, that when the coronal mass ejection comes in and its field is the same as the Earth, it squeezes the balloon. It does what you're saying. It doesn't push it away, there's not enough mass for that, but it squeezes it. And what that means, if you squeeze a balloon, the air inside gets hotter. 
So you energize inside. And so we see aurora and we see things like that. If the magnetic field is opposite the Earth, it's like it's got a pin in it and it bursts the balloon and it puts all the solar wind energy into the Earth's magnetic field. And so we get much stronger storms. Now, this may not impress you that much, but Houston is at 30 degrees latitude. It's subtropical. I'm from Glasgow, which is 56, not Glasgow, um, a couple of miles away. Glasgow uh, in Scotland, which is 56 degrees latitude. Um, so we can, not in big cities, but at that latitude you see northern lights. We have songs about northern lights and all sorts of stuff. During some of these big storms, it can put so much energy into the Earth's magnetosphere that you can see aurora as far south as Houston, Texas. My funny story is California one was when, uh, some of you are old enough to remember that garage door openers used to be uh, radio, not infrared as they are now. One of these big storms hit, I think, in 1989, and it was all the... There was all these garage doors opening and closing in Los Angeles. But being California, nobody thought it was any particularly weird compared to anything else, right? But, but these things can happen. And so, so we see those physics. We see that physics every day. But, um, but the planetary billiards, we don't have to worry about so much. We have had collisions, which is where we think we got the moon from. We have had planets collide with the Earth in the distant formation period. We think that's where we got our moon from. But that's in a whole other lecture. Another question? I was wondering if, if how you're able to tell what the atmosphere is of some of these exoplanets. Like when it moves in front of the sun, can you see? the absorption spectrum uh, of the atmosphere as light passes to us? Right, so, so if you, look, uh, the example I gave was a very simple, was simplistic one. You've got a solid ball, which is the planet, and you've got a puffy ball around it, which is the atmosphere. So if you don't happen to have um, the ability to take spectra, if you're just looking at the light, then you can see, the, the cartoon basically showed a big vertical drop and then a big vertical uh, the, egre uh, the ingress and the egress of the transit were just basically big drops. So they are basically assuming a solid body. But if you look at how that drop is, the egress and the ingress can be different because the angle, it, could, it may not be doing this, it may be doing that. So there's a lot you can tell from that. But you can also tell how the, it doesn't have to drop like right away. If it actually drops and stays flat for a little bit and then drops, that might be because more light is getting through than you would expect for a solid body. That's an indication that there's at least some kind of atmosphere, and that's what we see with Venus. If you happen to be looking, now that we know these planets, remember, they're going around every, some of these planets, well, the gas giants obviously have lots of atmosphere, but some of these other planets, they're close in, in enough that they're going around every few days, 11 days, 10 days. So you can always go back and look at them, and so you can go back and look with spectra. Um, I think for these planets, it's very difficult for the reasons I said. I don't think they're going to have much of an atmosphere because they're so close. But you can actually take spectra, and some people have detected water vapor, for instance, in some of these planets, some of the, some of the gas giant planets at least. And you can, look, you can find signs of sodium and all sorts of stuff. So spectra, for those of you who don't know spectra, it basically takes light and breaks it up into lots of colors, but very, very finely detailed. That's, a huge, that's a, an amazing diagnostic tool for gases and so on. So you can, each gas has a, a fingerprint. And so by seeing that fingerprint, you know that neon's there, you know that sodium's there, you know all these things are. What you have to be careful of is that you're not seeing the spectrum from the star as opposed to the planet. So you have to do subtraction. There's a lot of kind of difficulties you have to deal with. But James Webb Space Telescope which has taken a while and a lot of dollars. Um, we're hoping we'll go up in 21. Um, fingers crossed for that, and it will take a, a several months to commission and so on. It should be going to. It should be looking at exoplanets, atmospheres, and they should be looking in for for signs of uh, with with very detailed spectra. So, I think we're quite excited about the James Webb Space Telescope when it comes to exoplanets. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, thanks again, Dr. Alexander. Um, I am going to now turn over to Crystal Hopper, but before we do that, I will remind everybody that we do have more of these guest lectures coming up later in the term, and there, there is a 
box out there is a, a box outside if you if you want to see more of these speakers come in I, we can always we can always use any type of any type of donations or anything that you're ca capable of providing so so if you're interested in these types of things there is a donation box outside we'll gladly put 100 your million dollars for a telescope right over here right all right 